This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Doug Baird, who is a professor of law at the University of Chicago. Also, probably, I don't want to say the world's leading, but perhaps the world's leading expert on bankruptcy, and also the author of numerous books. The most recent book is called The Unwritten Law of corporate reorganizations. You've also got this one. I was just going back and, and reading this. This is The Elements of Bankruptcy, and I found in here some notes from, gosh, 25 years ago or so. Another book called a Game Theory and the Law, which is co-authored. And of course, the textbooks, right, on contracts and, and bankruptcy. So welcome, Doug. Good to be here. You know, I've always been fascinated with bankruptcy, not just because of the elements of forgiveness, which I talked about in an earlier podcast, but as a teacher of strategy, we're always trying to figure out what the optimal trade-off is between commitment and flexibility, right? And we think of contracts as things which are binding, and we think of kind of equity relationships or things that are flexible. And bankruptcy is this incredible legal technology, which kind of, I don't know, it, it facilitates the reinvention of companies through taking things which are rigid and then, you know, making them malleable for a period of time, right? By taking these contracts, which are meant to be binding commitments and suspending them and allowing them to be rewritten. And it's really remarkable how it allows, I don't know, it, it allows for fundamental transformation, not just for corporations, but for individuals. I've been fascinated by bankruptcy law and you've obviously been fascinated by it. I mean, why is it such a fascinating field? I think it's one thing to say a promise should be kept, and we all think that if you make a promise, you should keep it. But on the other hand, we also have to confront reality. And the classic example of corporate bankruptcy is a railroad in the 19th century where you've spent $100 million building a railroad back in a day when $100 million was real money. And not enough people want to ride on the railroad. And what you've got is two pieces of iron and a piece of real estate that's 700 miles long and 15 feet wide. And its highest and best use is a railroad, but it's not going to be able to pay its creditors. We wish it could, but, you know, if wishing were having, beggars would ride horses. And so you have to make the best of the situation. And making the best of the situation requires recognizing the cold, hard reality. You can't get blood from a stone. And these contracts, these promises aren't going to be kept. And you have to get together and come across, get together in an adult way and say, okay, how are we going to make the best of a bad situation? Well, you know, when we think about violating contracts or reneging on contracts, you know, there's always this concern about strategic default, right? And so it seems like a big part of bankruptcy law is trying to discourage kind of strategic breaching of contracts and strategic default, but at the same time facilitating or allowing for the rewriting of these contracts in the event of some random shock. So it seems like a lot of the book, The Unwritten Law of Corporate Re Reorganizations, it kind of builds on this idea of how do judges, you know, judges are kind of put in a position where they have to, in some sense, make that distinction, right, between, or, you know, the law is crafted in a way so that it discourages bad behavior, but at the same time facilitates this rewriting of everything. Actually, I think the problem is even harder than you suggest, because in addition to everything else, you've got a business, and it's not as if the business can remain static. And so you have a bunch of competing parties. They have a bunch of rights outside of bankruptcy that you want to recognize. You don't want people to be able to walk away from their obligations. You want to make sure that creditors get paid first, but you also want to make sure that the company survives. You don't want to have fights among the Creditors such that you take the left-hand rails and I take the right-hand rails. That just, that just isn't something that makes any economic sense. The problem you have is that the judge who oversees this doesn't know how to run a railroad or doesn't know how to run a currency exchange or doesn't know how to run a toy company or doesn't know how to run an airline. And so the challenge for the judge is how do I ensure that these people negotiate in the shadow of the rights they have outside of bankruptcy and reach a coherent deal and decide what's best for the business when I myself don't know what's best for the business. Well, I've always been fascinated by this idea that judges, particularly in the American system, judges are put in positions where, you know, they have to do a lot of things. If you're just a random manager thrust in, 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 in charge of a company, that's hard enough. But for somebody who's got primarily a legal background and not a managerial background, it's, it must be, it's even harder. And yet that's what we're doing. We're putting them, these judges in a position where they're 
more or less the boss of the boss of these entities. Yeah, well, it's uh, part of what judges can do is if, for example, you have to figure out how much the company is worth to figure out who much get, who gets what, you talk to these judges and you say, well, how do you do that? You don't have an MBA. You don't know how to value companies. How do you do it? And to the extent they explain it, they say, look, I don't have an MBA. I can't value companies. But what I am good at is listening to people on both sides and listening to two stories and figuring out which one is the most plausible. The other thing they do is they say, look, what I can do is I can ultimately be the arbiter and I can ultimately make decisions, but I can also create an environment so that parties will figure out the best deal for themselves. I have a friend who's a bankruptcy judge who actually tells parties, he says, now look, my job as a judge is to make a decision. And here there's this existential decision that could finish either one of you completely. It's my job as a judge to make that decision. And I will make that decision for you. Now, of course, you have the alternative to figuring out what is in your mutual best interest. But if you can't do that, then come to me and I'll make the decision. But you should know that if you do that, something that I'm happy to do, you're trusting your fate to a monkey with a gun. You know, if you, I'm sure you've, you've, in your previous podcast, people have talked about Ronald Dworkin and the judge as Hercules. Yes, we've talked about monkeys with guns. I like that. But bankruptcy judges will say, no, look, I'm a monkey with a gun. And so you guys figure it out. And so the challenge for the bankruptcy judge is an analogy I think you can think of, especially given the World Cup is going on now, is the bankruptcy judge is, is like a referee in soccer. John Roberts said when he was being confirmed that a good judge calls balls and strikes. There is something called a ball or something called a strike and the judge calls them that. That's not at least what bankruptcy judges think of themselves as doing. They say, look, there are rules and we the ball goes through the goal. It's a goal. We don't have discretion about stuff like that. But with respect to a lot of other things, our responsibility is to make sure that the parties can together discover the best possible future for this current unhappy situation. And doing that means making decisions if you have to, but also knowing when to stand back and when to stand out of the way. And that's a little more complicated than just calling balls and strikes. But, you know, we know that the best kinds of bargains are made possible by very clear property rights, very clear rules. And so the bankruptcy code is quite elaborate and quite sophisticated, and there are a lot of, lot of parts to it. But even with all of those parts, there seems to be, I don't know, an element of norms that, that kind of fill in the gaps. That's a big part of your book is that this is a relatively closed group of lawyers that have developed some norms over time, right? That seems to be necessary for any, for the well-functioning of any, for any kind of body of law. You need to have some clear rules, but then you need to fill in the gaps with norms, right? Right. One fundamental principle of bankruptcy, not the subject of this book, but something I've written about a lot, is that bankruptcy takes non-bankruptcy rights as it finds them, and it doesn't create new substantive rights. If you're a debtor in bankruptcy, you have to obey the law just like anyone else. If, if what you've acquired before bankruptcy is a right to half a black acre, what you have in bankruptcy is a right to half a black acre. You don't get all of it just because that would help yeah. you. Um, you don't get relief from anti-pollution laws simply because you're in bankruptcy. You have to follow the same rules as everyone else. Bankruptcy takes non-bankruptcy rights as, they, as it finds them. Now, the problem, of course, is figuring out, okay, in a world of uncertainty, in a world where we don't quite know what we want to do, in a world where some deals don't make sense anymore, how are we going to, to remake them? Now, one thing that I don't think bankruptcy judges should do and that my book isn't about is bankruptcy judges shouldn't invent new substantive rights. They shouldn't give you a right you never had before. But that's different. These substantive rights are different than the rules that govern the bargaining, these meta rules. What are the conditions and the norms of the bargaining environment? And it's not a question of, of the deal, but rather who gets a seat at the table and how we figure out the agenda and all these other things. And one of the lessons of game theory and these other literatures are that the rules governing the bargain, the terms of engagement matter a lot. And if you ask what are those terms of engagement? What are these rules, not about substantive rights, but about how parties bargain with each other? That's what's unwritten. And accessing those and understanding those is something that is, is, is baffling to outsiders and baffling for reasons that you mentioned, which is that the for reasons of history that we can get into, the bankruptcy world is remarkably closed. And it is still remarkably closed. 
and it has a limited set of players who interact with each other um, multiple times. Now, you might think that's a bad thing, but you can also say it's a good thing, that the fact that you and I are going to be dealing with each other many times in the future, and indeed sometimes on the same side, sometimes opposed to each other, means that there may be long-term norms that govern our bargaining. And one of the things the judge has to do is the judge has to account for those norms in trying to figure out how to create an environment and what norms to respect, what norms not to respect, and how to push parties, not in the direction where the judge knows the firm is supposed to go, because the judge doesn't know that, but rather push the parties so that they will find a common destiny for the firm that will make everyone better off. Well, I do want to get into the history. I'm an historian, so I want to go back to the very beginning. And you go back to the uh, Statute of 13 Elizabeth, which is from 1571. And I think your point is that animates the entire kind of history of bankruptcy. It lives in the background, and it's really all about fraudulent conveyance. Could you talk about that and maybe talk about, like, before that, before 1571, was there, what happened when if a company, if someone defaulted on their debts, right? We still had debtor's prison long after 1571. But maybe talk a bit about where did that statute come from? How does that continue to inform pretty much everything that a bankruptcy judge does? Well, a lot of things are lost in the midst of time. At least the reception of the statute of 13 Elizabeth, this 1571 statute in this country, was one to say that this is a parliament by statute by parliament that basically restated or embodied what was already imminent in the common law. In other words, the argument would be that, sure, we have this statute, but what this statute is doing is simply crystallizing ideas that were already in the air anyway. And the basic idea of this statute, again, as it came to be understood by 1602 in this famous case I also talked about called Twine's case, was that if you're a debtor, you can't defraud your creditors. Everybody understood that. Everybody understood that I couldn't simply hide assets and or take off to another jurisdiction, and that doing that was something that violated the rights of creditors. But what they also figured out very early on was this idea that other kinds of transactions that were simply too clever by half, that I could argue, well, this is not technically legal. This is the kind of thing that lay people sometimes think you can get away with, where, oh, do this, and technically speaking, it's okay, and it's really cute, and so forth. Basically, by the 16th century, people said, no, look, if it's too cute by half, it's still not going to be any good. And there is this general principle that was accepted and understood by courts in this country by the late 18th century during colonial times, that that any transaction that a debtor makes that is while insolvent to an insider for no legitimate business purpose that is done, and you can't think of any reason why it would be done other than to hinder, delay, and defraud creditors. We're going to strike that down. We don't have to prove the debtor was dishonest. We just have to say, look, this transaction is just a little bit too cute, okay? And this general power of the judge to strike down transactions that were too cute is essentially the power they looked to when they oversaw negotiations among creditors when debtors were in default. And they basically said, look, if there are cute maneuverings among these various people, then we as judges have a right to come in and do something about it. Not that we're saying that there is any fraud actually practiced, but simply we're going to require people to cut square corners in in, in this context. And we're going to make sure you do things according to whole. And that's a right that we have as judges. And what's happened over time is people have started from this general idea. Judges have started from this general idea that they can invoke this general power to strike down transactions that are too cute by half to basically create a set of bargaining norms. And these bargaining norms have evolved and changed over time. But the norms that judges use today, the norms that judges will use to say, no, look, I'm not going to approve this transaction. No, I'm not going to approve this deal. No, you've got to do something else. Where those powers come from is from this power that's imminent in the common law that allows you to make sure that parties have to cut square corners when a debtor is distressed and multiple creditors are involved. So this is really about prioritizing substance over form, right? It's like the principle of of equity in jurisdictions. Exactly. In other words, even if you can't find a technical transfer from the debtor to someone else, if it has the same effect, judges have the power to come in and strike it down. And again, in the first chapter, I talk about this 
rather complicated land deal with Robert Morris, who has uh, one of the two people with the American trifecta of being a signer of the Declaration of Independence, signer of the Articles of Confederation, signer of the Declaration of Independence. He's the financier of the American Revolution. His picture is on the dome of the Capitol during the apotheosis of George Washington. He was the savior of the American Revolution, at least by George Washington's account. And he ends up in debtor's prison. And while he's in debtor's prison, he does this very shady land deal involving several thousand square miles of land, including what is all of now Buffalo, New York. And and in the book, I trace through these machinations in which he basically goes through this elaborate deal in which he tries to get an annuity for his wife while he does some things with these other investors. And the question is, can he get away with it? And what power does the court have to intervene? I think today he would just get a book deal and that would probably uh, salvage his finances. Well, you also talk about this guy, um, but was his name McCle- McClelland, or he was another? Yeah, he was a partner of Morris, also in the House of Representatives, also in debtor's prison with Morris, and also involved in shady dealings. And again, one of these first great fraudulent conveyance cases in, in, involves him. And he makes a transfer of all of substantially all of his assets to a group of his creditors. And you can't say he's affirmatively fraudulent. And what he appears to have done is simply taken his assets and given them to his creditors. So it could go wrong. And the court looks at it and says, no, actually, you're doing that in order to thwart other creditors. And yeah. this wasn't really a straight deal. And we're going to not hold it up. We're going to do a do-over. Because even though, as a matter of form, all you're doing is paying off your creditors, which is unobjectionable in a world where there's no bankruptcy. You can pick and choose which creditors you pay. Yeah. Nevertheless, we're not going to allow this transaction because this transaction has a structure that makes us think that what you are about is trying to thwart other creditors of yours. Now, this is, of course, in, enshrined in the bankruptcy code as an avoidable preference, right? Well, what makes this case interesting, and again, for those of you who keep track, is that it does sound very much like avoidable preference. So if you're a bankruptcy lawyer listening to me talk, you would say, wait a second, Douglas, that's just avoidable preference. But at the time this case was decided, there was no bankruptcy law in this country. There was no preference law. So even though it's based upon, the courts are relying on English statutes that we now think of as the first preference statutes, this idea that you can't pick and choose among your creditors on the eve of bankruptcy. That didn't have any applicability in this case, because in this case, there was no bankruptcy law. Preferences were perfectly okay. So the fact that this transaction was preferential wasn't what made it objectionable. So the U.S. has had a couple of different bankruptcy laws. And to my knowledge, the U.S. was really the first country to have elaborate bankruptcy laws. It seems like a uniquely American thing. And People come from all over the world to file for bankruptcy in the U.S. What is it about the U.S. that has always put it at the kind of bleeding edge of bankruptcy innovation? I think there are two things. First, we've always been a debtor nation. And indeed, if you look at debates over the Bill of Rights, I think people who aren't lawyers or aren't familiar with this history would be surprised that a big issue about the Bill of Rights was basically protecting debtors, because there is this fear that these federal courts in Philadelphia would basically rule in favor of creditors, Alexander Hamilton's friends, and debtors would actually, among other things, have to actually pay them. And there are these arguments by the anti-federalists when they're opposing the Constitution is saying, no, of course, creditors should get paid. But they have to run a particular gauntlet now. There's no reason why with this new thing, Constitution, they should not still have to run that gauntlet. And there should be jury trials and creditors from New York City or London should have to come to our local town and persuade the local jury that, you know, of these particular facts. And so we were always a republic of debtors and protecting debtors and so forth is something that we always cared about. So that's one ball that's in the air. The other thing is just that we were the first country to have giant railroads to connect the country that were privately financed. And so the first industrial revolution may have been in, in England with cotton mills in, in Lancaster. But if you're a cotton mill in, in Manchester, the amount of capital you have is not that large. And these companies were not, were not built with debt capital or even capital from outside investors. It was basically families contributing their capital to run a business. So you could have an 800-person textile mill in in Lancaster, in England, in the first Industrial Revolution. And you didn't have bankruptcy law because, again, you didn't have widely distributed debt. On the other hand, when you had these giant railroads, 
that was a different matter altogether. And because it was privately financed, when these railroads failed, as many of them did in the 19th century, you had to sort it out. And interestingly, the, the modern Chapter 11 originates as much from the equity receivership, this equitable doctrine that grew up in the late 19th century, as much as it does from the text of the bankruptcy code that was put into its modern form, more or less, in the 1898 Bankruptcy Act. So the short answer to your question is is simply, we had two things going on. We were a debtor nation, and we were also the first nation to deploy outside capital on a massive scale. Yeah, it's really remarkable when we look back at that system, which facilitated arm's length transacting, but there was still a, I don't know, old boys network that kind of encouraged a set of norms, right? So there was this repeated interaction between players who knew each other fairly well. When we think about the, I know there's a lot of research into bank finance, right? So if you have a lead bank that lends a company money, company runs into trouble, the bank has an incentive to renegotiate the deal with the borrower, right? Because if you foreclose on the borrower, then, you know, the borrower business goes away. You never, you're not going to recoup nearly as much as you would if you could rewrite this. But when you have bondholders and you have lots and lots of different people with claims, then it becomes much more, more complicated. How were they able in the 19th century to effectively engage in the redrafting of these debt agreements, even though you had dispersal of claim holders? Well, you had essentially the same players we have now, familiar names like J.P. Morgan, were people who both sold bonds. They'd go to Europe and find wealthy people in Amsterdam or Frankfurt or London to invest in in American railroad bonds. And when those bonds got into trouble, these same bankers would basically go back to their investors and say, look, this needs to be renegotiated. We'll renegotiate on your behalf. And so Essentially, what you had is some investment banks. You also had some life insurance companies. New York Life was involved then in a number of these. So widows and orphans weren't holding bonds back in those days, right? No, no. Even later on, it wasn't widows and orphans. But basically, a lot of the capital in the late 19th century came from Europe. And they were represented by large investment banks like J.P. Morgan and their law firms like to use their modern names, the same firms, modern names, Davis Polk, Crevasse, Swain, and Moore. These lawyers were were there in those transactions, and J.P. Morgan uh, was there for the long haul. Their lawyers were there for the long haul. And the reason you know their lawyers were there for the long haul is one of the nice things about the lawyers being there for the long haul and the investment bankers being there for the long haul is the investors could trust them. They could basically say, look, you guys are going to come back to us and ask for our money again. We're only going to give it to you again if you do right by us when things have to be restructured and you don't sell us down the river. And so that's, again, a fundamental part of the story that even in the late 19th century, if you look at the characters who were involved, the characters are a relatively small group of known people. Everybody knows each other. And again, it's interesting that this small world of people who do this corporate finance stuff is is still a small world. And I'm amazed in these large bankruptcy cases that you'll ask, gee, who's... Whose case is this? We learn about a new case that's just filed. And the answer typically is, oh, this is Jamie's case. And you don't give the last name. You don't give the name of the law firm. You just say Jamie, and everybody knows who you're talking about. And again, back in the, I talk at some length about the reorganization of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. And the lawyer involved there is Victor Morowitz. And he's he retired young. He was replaced by a, a young lawyer in his firm named Paul Cravath. And his name fell off of the name of the law firm, and now Cravath's name is there. Victor Morowitz is basically this guy that everybody knows, and he's involved in all these cases. And so is a man named Stetson, who ultimately founds the firm we now know as Davis Polk. And these were the guys who were involved, and there just weren't that many of them. Well, I'm wondering if you could talk also about these credit men, because I, I talked with Tony Cronman about a little bit about the you know his notion of the role of the lawyer, particularly in the 19th century, right? And these credit men, they seem to be, I don't know, they seem to, th- they think that they were doing like God's work, right? They believed right. that they were in the s- service of promoting honest practice and discouraging bad behavior. They had a very, it's almost like quasi, I don't know, 
charitable slash spiritual mission to what their work was. Could you talk about these credit men? How did they get this organ, this group get formed and how did they see themselves just saying the honorable business people over here and the bad actors over here? There's a, again, this is a second strand to the story. The one strand we've been talking about with J.P. Morgan, those are the railroad people and the people who created these large railroads, okay? At the same time this is going on, the other large story in the United States, which we can think of, we probably know best from things like The Music Man, where you have these traveling salesmen and stuff like that. But during the same time that these railroads allowed cattle to come from all parts of the country and go to Chicago and allow people to travel. They also allowed goods and services to flow from east to west. And so you had these very large wholesalers, wholesalers like Marshall Field and Montgomery Ward and others who would basically go out to retail stores throughout the country. And and these retail merchants in a small town would essentially agree to buy on credit their inventory for the dresses for the summer or the men's clothes or... Yeah, at one point you said the trade credit exceeded the money supply at some point, I think. By a lot. By yeah. a lot. Yeah. The, it's it, You buy the stuff on credit, sell it to the farmers on credit. The farmers bring in their harvest, they get the hard money, they pay off the retailer, pays off the wholesaler. And and that was a major part of the economy. And and at, here, you again started to have large firms like Field and Montgomery Ward would have hundreds of people in them. And a new professional class emerged during this period. You had the professional class of the people who ran the railroads. In the 18th century, the people who ran the business were the people who owned the business, who were people who were one-man bands when it came to their operations. By the time you have the railroads or these large wholesalers, you have lots of professional people. They don't own the business and they don't run the entire business. They just tend to one part of it. And one part of running a large wholesale business like this is I'm attending to the credit risk and also making good on the various credit risks that you have. A professional class grows up of professionals who specialize in issuing credit to these small retailers scattered throughout the country. And they call themselves credit men. The organization exists today, but unsurprisingly, they've changed their names to credit managers. But back then, they were the credit men, and they were a fraternal organization. They had journals that you can still read. They had conferences. They had gatherings, and they had parties where people gave after-dinner speeches. And again, if you devote your professional life to doing something, you would like to think that you're doing good. And these people really thought they were doing good, and they really created a moral universe. And their moral universe distinguished between the honorable merchant and then the bad guy, the fraudster, the person who sold out his stock and skipped town and stuff like that. And so part of their rhetoric is painting between the dishonest, despicable merchant who we should really go after, and then there's this person on the other side, the honorable person who might be unfortunate, but if they're honorable and they're straight and they don't do side deals with their friends, but they're respectful of those of us who are 800 miles away and are at risk of being hometown by local courts, if they're respectable and do right by us, then you, we're not going to kick them when they're down. And that becomes an article of faith among them. And the people who represent them, the lawyers who represent them, become, for complicated reasons in the 1930s, up the, the new generation of bankruptcy lawyers. And they create their own fraternal organizations. And again, they also think that we're doing God's work and we're doing God's work because on the one hand, we're protecting the unfortunate but honest debtor. We're going to give people who are down on their luck a second chance. But on the other hand, we're going to clobber people who are dishonest. One of the reasons we have the rhetoric of bankruptcy about helping the unfortunate and so forth is it's a legacy of these professionals with these, this worldview. Now, I was wondering if you could talk about Jerome Frank and William Douglas, because these are the kind of New Deal lawyers who, who came in, and they were primarily, well, they're practitioners and academics, but they had, a, I guess, what, a more cynical view, that was one way to say it. I mean, they had maybe a more realistic view of the closed networks that kept this whole system afloat, and they were trying to create something that was more... I was thinking about similarities between what they were doing and saying and what Burley and Means were saying on, about equity. You didn't mention Burley and Means, but that was part of the same movement. Yeah, I would say that the law we have today comes out of three different sources. Okay, one is, and we've talked about the first two, one are the J.P. Morgans and the Victor Morowitzes and these large law firms like Davis Polk and Cravath 
and these large investment banks that reorganized large railroads and had their norms among themselves about how large railroads were to be reorganized. The second group, which we've also talked about, were the credit men and their lawyers and dealing with small businesses and how you distinguish between dishonest small businesses that were basically playing favorites with their friends and so forth. And then we have this third group. And these third group were these New Deal reformers. And principal among them were Jerome Douglas, I'm sorry, Jerome Frank and William O. Douglas, both of whom taught at Yale. Jerome Frank is best known in legal academic circles as being the lawyer who went through psychoanalysis and wrote Law in the Modern Mind and was one of these great legal realist thinkers. And and a lot of the people who talk about Jerome Frank um, don't have the slightest idea that he started life as a reorganization lawyer and wrote a lot of law review articles about corporate reorganizations. But back then, doing corporate reorganizations was really cool. That's what the hip ap- academics did during the 1930s. And then you had William O. Douglas, who was a law professor at Yale who specialized in corporate reorganizations. Again, he's now known today as the great liberal member of the Warren Court, but at least he started life as a, re- as a reorganization lawyer, and then he was teaching at Yale. And they had a reformist view of corporate reorganizations that was completely antagonistic to the J.P. Morgans and the Paul Cravats and the Robert Swains. And their view was, they weren't really focused on these small bankruptcies. That wasn't where their hearts were. But their view of these large reorganizations, inspired in part because of the way capital formation had changed after the First World War, was that Corporate reorganizations were basically a club that was favoring insiders. Thurman Arnold wrote a book called The Folklore of Capitalism, in which he talked about how you have the lawyers and the investment bankers and the corporate insiders, and they reorganize corporations. They get paid twice. They get paid once for selling these bad bonds, and then they get paid again for restructuring them, and they feather their own nest and get incredibly large fees, and in the end, the outside investor pays. And remember, this is a world where you're a professional in Peoria, you're a dentist or mm-hmm. a doctor or something like that, and you've bought bonds for your retirement because it's not as if you have real estate or other things in which you can store your wealth. You don't want to put it in banks. And then you discover that your nest egg is destroyed because these reorganization lawyers have restructured your bonds and left you with something that's worth Now, to be fair, before World War I, there were no outside investors. Everybody was an insider, right? No, they were outside investors. They were just from London and Frankfurt and yeah. Amsterdam. And we were still a debtor. They were by members of the club. So so they, they were their interests were protected. Yeah, their, at first their interests were protected. And also the law reformers were not terribly concerned with what happened to bankers in London or Amsterdam. But all of a sudden you had this image of the small investor. And again, these people were never poor. The face amount of these bonds is still in the thousands of dollars. But nevertheless, the image of the prototypical investor changes. And the New Deal lawyers who go to Washington go and they go with this mission of protecting these investors who are holding bonds and are losing out in these corporate reorganizations. And the SEC, as originally formulated, was really designed to help these people in corporate reorganizations, not so much the IPOs and the equity stuff that we think about today. And so William O. Douglas and Jerome Frank both become chair of the SEC in sequence. And in addition to fashioning the 33 Act and the 34 Act, they also created the Chandler Act. And they had a certain vision. Now, they also invoked the Chapter 13 Elizabeth. They also thought these principles of fraudulent conveyance law should apply. They just had a different vision of them, and they put that vision into the Chandler Act. And essentially, what you had during the 1930s was bargaining between the J.P. Morgans and the Paul Cravass, the credit men, and William O. Douglas and Jerome Frank, the New Deal reformers, and They're each advancing their own agenda as far as what bankruptcy law should look like in the future. And what ultimately happens is that Frank and Douglas get together with the credit men because they all of a sudden realize that their interests don't conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. And they create Chapter 10, Chapter X, and Chapter 11, Chapter XI, respectively, in the Chandler Act. It has the effect of freezing out J.P. Morgan and Paul Cravath from the restructuring business. But we have the vision for large restructurings that Douglas 
and Frank favored, and we have the vision for small restructurings of retailers and like that the credit men favored. And that was the ultimate upshot of the reforms is these three contending forces coming together. Now, to, to what extent was this sort of aspirational? Like they were trying to craft a capital market that was, I don't know, more liquid, accessible, democratic. Was it really about protecting existing small investors or was it about like, hey, we, we want to craft a world where the, the capital markets behave in very different ways? It's a little hard to say. I'm not sure that Douglas and Frank had a great faith in capital markets. You read some of their stuff and it seems as if they think that capital markets are like a casino and people want to put their money in a casino. Okay, we're not going to second guess it. And again, if you think about the securities laws, American casino securities laws are very unusual in the sense that the securities, SEC doesn't vet the quality of the corporation or the quality of the business or the prospects of the business. They just require disclosure. And a part of the impetus, as best I can tell from Douglas and Frank, is not so much they believed in capital formation and they had a vision of regulation making free markets better and generating wealth as much as they said, well, here's a casino and people want to play in the casino. The job of the law is just to make sure that the game is fair and that it's not rigged. And if the system's not rigged and people want to gamble there, that's fine. We're not going to tell people not to gamble, but we are going to make sure that the dice are fair. Now, no, things didn't quite turn out the way Frank and Douglas intended. So chapter X kind of didn't really was a have, much of a, have much of a life. But Doc, can you talk about this composition idea and what was the idea behind the composition and how did it differ from the equity receivership? So we were left in the 1930s with these two different ideas. One is a formal restructuring of large companies. And this is the idea of Frank and Douglas. And that didn't work in part because it was too rigid. And you had very slow federal regulators who acted too slowly. You had formal rules. You had a rule that required that the second the managers filed for reorganization, they all lost their jobs and an outsider came in to run the firm. Well, it, this shouldn't come as shouldn't have come as a news flash, but if you tell someone the second you do X, you're going to lose their job, they're going to be reluctant to do X. And so it turns out people were very reluctant to file for Chapter 10. They filed too late. Its procedures were too complicated and so forth. And then there's this thing called the arrangement or the friendly adjustment that grew out of the common law composition. And this is this idea that if all the creditors as a group voted in favor of a particular idea, a particular restructuring, and everyone is similarly situated, and a majority or a supermajority said, yeah, this is a good idea for the company going forward, then what you could do is you could bind dissenters. The idea was that if you have 100 people, you're never going to get them all to agree about on everything. But if you can get a majority to agree that the debt should be restructured, then that was fine. And they had this notion, and this is part of the norms of the credit men, that it was dishonorable if you're a credit man to refuse to vote against a sensible composition. It violated the norms of conduct if you tried to hold out for payment in full when that wasn't going to happen. And the idea also was that if everything is above board and the judge has looked and made sure that there's been disclosure and everyone's had a complete opportunity and everyone's had a chance to vote. And if everyone voting is similarly situated, sure, the vote's going to leave you with only 50 cents in the dollar, but I'm voting in favor. Of, I'm only going to get 50 cents in the dollar. Then it's a sensible way to, to restructure things. And that idea of having this composition among similarly situated creditors where a majority would bind a similarly situated minority, that was thought to be okay. And at least that was the idea that was accepted for these small reorganizations of small firms, the small retailers, the retail store in San Antonio that's down on its lock. And so the bankruptcy law that we, there's been reforms to it, but the 1978 Bankruptcy Act, and this is the one that we're living with right now. What changes were made at that time? And what was so important about that? And why has that been such a successful law, even though it's had tweaks to it? Basically, the central innovation of the 1978 law was to combine the Frank and Douglas approach and the credit man approach into one single statute that is now Chapter 11. So what it allows for is it allows for 
a majority to bind the minority, something that Chapter X did not allow. It basically allowed individual dissenters to say, unless I am paid in full, no one junior to me can get anything. And they abolished that, and they basically put in place a set of rules that offers protections for the creditors, but allows the majority to bind the minority. They got rid of the rule in Chapter 10 that said, as soon as you filed for bankruptcy, you're out of work. They allowed existing corporate managers to continue in place. And essentially what they did is they empowered the lawyers representing the credit men. They were essentially the last men standing because remember, Cravath and the lawyers representing J.P. Morgan were excluded from bankruptcy after the Chandler Act. People like William O. Douglas and Jerome Frank went on to other pastors. William O. Douglas went on the Supreme Court. People like Edward Levy, who wrote about bankruptcy, becomes a law professor at the University of Chicago, then dean, then president, and then attorney general. Lloyd Cutler was also involved in this world. Thurman Arnold was involved in this world. Abe Fortas was involved in this world. And I'm listing all these bankruptcy lawyers who you've heard of, but you probably didn't even know they were bankruptcy lawyers. They went off to other things. The last men standing were the lawyers representing the credit men who had handled successfully these small cases. They got together in the 1970s and said, look, we have an opportunity. People aren't peering over our shoulders. We can put together a comprehensive bankruptcy code that will work not simply for small companies, but also for large companies. And again, a relatively small number of identifiable people got together and they came up with this consensus approach. And they were able to go to Congress and say, look, here's a sensible approach to bankruptcy. And Congress enacted it in 1978. Well, I mean, that one of those aspects, the formation of these committees and the binding of the minority, this is something we see in other areas of law as well, going back to the enclosure movement and the whether it's unitization trusts we see in, in the oil industry or the formation of bids in, in cities. This idea that the best interest of the collectivity can be advanced only through majority rule in some sense. That's a principle that we see in, in many areas of law, particularly in common law, right? Is this one reason why so many corporate reorganization bankruptcy attorneys have wound up taking a prominent place in, in, in our legal history? Is it because there's so many principles of law that you have to confront when you're dealing with a reorganization? Exactly. There are these two ideas that are going on that are make bankruptcy such, such an incredible area for study. First, there is this collective action problem. And this is a pervasive problem in the law for reasons that you point out. You have overfishing of a common pond. You have overgrazing of a common pasture. You have overdrilling of an oil well. You have a city block where you aren't able to build because ownership interests have been divided up so much. So the idea of the law coming in and overcoming these problems that where the self-interest of the individual isn't really in the interest of the group and understanding that everybody in the group is better off in this Rawlsian sense if you allow the group itself to make a decision. That's the essence of democratic, democratic action. And bankruptcy recognizes that and takes that to heart. Second, if you're a bankruptcy lawyer, and you're representing a debtor in bankruptcy, and that's what you do, then remember, you're going to have a different client every six months, at least you hope, right? Because once you've taken someone through bankruptcy, you're not supposed to have them as a client. Again, not we, we fail in that a number of times. But it essentially means that you talk to a bankruptcy lawyer, and they were an energy lawyer last year. They're, they're representing a toy store this year then a department store, then a cryptocurrency exchange. And and so what they're doing is they're representing a different business. And as a bankruptcy lawyer, it's a little bit like being an oncologist where you're dealing with a patient who's really not in very good shape, but at least unlike a specialist who only looks at one part of your anatomy and does that with a thousand different patients, bankruptcy lawyers get to treat the whole patient. They get to be generalists in the way that a lot of modern lawyers aren't. They basically encounter a, a new person in a new industry with a vast array of legal problems. And their challenge is, okay, how do I think about all these problems that I've never encountered before? And they see them all through the lens of bankruptcy, but they see all these different problems, which makes it incredibly interesting. Now, one, one of the more granular issues that you dig into in the new book is the compare and contrast between the absolute priority rule and alternatives like relative priority. Right. And one of the reasons why I thought the absolute priority rule was made a lot of sense, and you talk about it in your other books, right, is that it lays out something that is very clear, right? It's yeah. very easy to understand. There's very little disagreement, but the rigidity of it 
can lead to some kind of perverse outcomes. And you talk about the relative priority rule as being something which made its own, had its own logic and made it, made its own sense. And sometimes you need to grease the skids. Hey, sometimes you have to do some things which seem to violate this very clear cut set of rules. And if, if we were to go back and re-examine some of the earlier cases, like the Morris case, it's possible that, that what was happening there was really, you needed to make some kind of bargain to, to move the ball down the field, right? And how do you distinguish between what you called a, a tip and, and fraud? Yeah, I, again, a bunch of different balls in the air. So let me just start with the absolute priority rule, which, as you say, has remarkable virtues. And one of the virtues is that it's really clear. The idea of an absolute priority rule is that bankruptcy or corporate reorganization or whatever it is, is a day of reckoning, okay? And we're going to figure out, okay, this is the amount that everybody is owed. We're going to discount everything to present value. We're going to collapse all liabilities to present value. We're going to line people up and we're going to say, okay, here's this corporation. Either we're going to sell it and turn it into cash, line people up and dole out the cash according to whatever their non-bankruptcy priorities are until we run out. Or alternatively, we'll create a new corporation and we'll create stock or securities in the new reorganization, and then we'll parcel them out. But basically, the idea is that we're going to figure out the value of your interest, the time of the reorganization, and we're going to treat your rights accordingly. And this has the advantage of being clear. There's very little game playing. There isn't an ability for people to jump their place in the queue. It's very easy to ensure that outsiders aren't frozen out. One of the reasons absolute priority came into being, perhaps the principal reason, is that people like Frank and Douglas saw too many opportunities if you depart from that. Okay. An alternative priority scheme, which is theoretically as rigorous, is relative priority. And that basically says what we're going to do in a reorganization, it's more complicated. What we're going to do is we're going to recognize the option value of out-of-the-money interest. In other words, if I'm owed 100 and there's a lottery ticket, with a one in 10 chance of producing a thousand and you have the residual claim to whatever is left, how valuable is my interest? How valuable is your interest? If we simply take a snapshot today, I'm entitled to the entire lottery ticket because that's the amount it can be sold for, a one in 10 chance with a sales so, no, force. Absolute priority rule accelerates the expiration date of the options. Exactly. And a, a technical way to describe the absolute priority rule, no, not the way Douglas or other people thought about it because they didn't know about Black Shoals, they didn't know about options or whatever. But basically, the what they're, you can think of any creditor, right of any creditor, as this option component to it. And what absolute priority rule does is it accelerates the exercise date of the option that junior people have. And the reality is if you collapse things to now, then if you want to buy me out, you know, it's going to cost you 100 because that's the amount that I can get today that the lottery ticket sells for today. On the other hand, if you don't accelerate that, if we don't have a day of reckoning today, you're going to get a lot more because nine chances in 10, neither one of us is going to get anything. And if the lottery ticket proves to be a winner, then I get 100 and you get 90. So it turns out that if we don't collapse things today, I get 10 and you get 90. There's a huge difference. And relative priority basically says, look, we have a company, we need a new capital structure, but it's not a day of reckoning. It's like an exchange offer. There's no reason to cash out interest, even if in a day of reckoning, they'd be out of the money because it's not a day of reckoning. Okay. And the equity receivership- It's a day of reckoning because- we're saying it's a day of reckoning. Yeah, I'd say it's a day of reckoning, but you don't have to. And where the firm is continuing and it's continuing to pay trade creditors where people on the outside are buying at Macy's or flying on United Airlines or buying cars from General Motors as before, why should there be a come to Jesus moment? If the firm is continuing and we need a new capital structure, why should it be that junior people are wiped out just because in the counterfactual world where we liquidated everything, they wouldn't get anything? That's counterfactual. Okay, that's the argument. And at least that was accepted. Also, if you think about the equivalent of an exchange offer, if I do an exchange offer, we don't think of an exchange offer as liquidation events. We think of them as say, okay, look, here's a new capital structure. Here's the deal. You'll get equity instead of debt, but the equity you get will trade for more than the debt that you had because we've increased the value of the company because we don't have this debt overhang anymore. When we have exchange offers, we don't say, no, that has to be associated with collapsing the option value of the out-of-the-money junior interest. So 
That was the thought they had in the 19th century. Now, again, they didn't express it with modern finance, but that was the idea. So that's one thing that was lingering in the background. Now, the pushback against that is that as soon as you're talking about option values and stuff like that, there's a lot more fuzziness. And you have a lot more fuzziness in a world where there's ambiguity about exactly what someone is doing. The paradigmatic example is we have this chief executive officer and you have a senior creditor and the senior creditor wants to come in and wants to credit bid the amount they're owed. And they say, look, I'm owed 200. The firm's worth at most 150. I'll take the entire firm, which is what I'm entitled to. And and also the manager is actually pretty good. He was brought on board fairly recently. He's not responsible for the decline of the corporation. I also want to keep him on board. And of course, I'll tell him that because I don't want him to leave and get a job someplace else. And everything is great. And life goes forward. And of course, the new manager will get some options because I need to give him the right set of incentives. And his old options are, of course, not going to be worth anything. And that all seems fine. And what could go wrong? The problem that you run into, which is a little bit orthogonal to absolute versus relative priority, though it's easy in a way with in the world of relative priority, is let's say the CEO is in fact, the conversation goes somewhat differently, where I'm the senior creditor and I say, look, I'm owed 200. The firm's probably worth 150. Who knows? Wink, wink, nod, nod. You know, surely you manager probably think it's only worth 150. No reason to kick the tires. I'll provide you some financing. And also, by the way, I'm happy to continue in your current salary as a strategic consultant. And the sale goes through to me quickly, where there's not a lot of competition because we need to move fast because this is a melting ice cube and we're going to move fast and so forth. And you can push this sound plan forward to the bankruptcy judge. You should just know I want to keep you as a strategic consultant for five years at your current salary. And just to make sure that you have the right frame of mind, I want you to sell your house, move to Florida, buy a condo by the country club play a lot of golf, throw away your cell phone, and think strategically about the company. And then the manager says, yeah, that's I'd like being a strategic consultant. That sounds great. And he supports the senior creditor's plan. And two weeks later, the senior creditor ends up with the firm. And the firm, of course, might have actually been worth a lot more than 200, but we'll never find out because there has been this arrangement where the senior creditor will say, oh, there's no arrangement. I was just retaining strategic consultants, something I'm allowed to do. And the question you have there is what do you do about that kind of bargaining? And this goes back to where we started, which is what is the unwritten law here? There's no particular specific rule in the bankruptcy code written in 1978 about limitations on secured creditors employing strategic consultants or what the terms of being a strategic consultant are, or whether you have to have cell phones or whether you can play golf. And what you have to do is you have to come up with an oversight of this bargaining that distinguishes between the CEO who basically is being paid to grease the skids and look the other way, and the CEO who may actually have skills that someone needs going forward, and the senior creditor is really the best and highest bidder. And you have to say, how can I create a bargaining environment where I know that this is going on? How can I make sure that objections are raised at the right time? How can I make sure there's not a fancy side deal. And what you don't want a judge to do is to say, oh, technically speaking, there's no property going from the debtor to pay off the CEO. And the only the money that's coming is coming from the senior creditor. And because it's the senior creditor's money, it's not technically money of the estate. And therefore, it's not a problem. You can't look formally at what's happening. You have to have a sense of, okay, how do I make sure that the bargaining field is level here? Yes. Yeah, so that problem could arise regardless of what the priority rule is. That's about... Exactly. Right. Now, there wasn't that long ago during the financial crisis that we had some very interesting violations of the absolute priority rule. In particular, when we think about the collapse of the automotive industry. And I think some people at the time said, oh, this is it. This is the end, right? When the the union creditors and the pension funds and the their other claimants that wound up getting put ahead of the secured creditors. And this was very controversial. Can you just talk a bit about that? Because th- that seems to be an example of where the judge, under one view, the judge determined that, listen, the only way we can keep this company alive and viable as a as a company is to make sure that we have the kind of unions on board. Another view is that, hey, this whole process got politicized and, and that's not acceptable. 
Can you just talk a bit about how does that fit in with the framework around bringing people on board, understanding the necessities of continuing the enterprise? Yeah, I think the, the, I think this is a perhaps a whole other discussion, but I think a part of the problem with the automobile bankruptcy is neither side was being particularly straight about about the issues. And also GM and Chrysler were two different cases, but let me talk about Chrysler. Chrysler owed its secured creditors like seven billion. And at the time, if you looked at Chrysler, there there were essentially two choices that you had with Chrysler. You could either just shut the whole thing down and liquidate it immediately. That was choice number one. Choice number two is you could liquidate it, but you could do it slowly enough so that people wouldn't really notice the difference and you'd keep all the suppliers of Chrysler intact. And sure, Chrysler would disappear as a company for all practical purposes, but you'd, we do it in a way that people don't really notice. Now, the Obama administration, rightly or wrongly, saw those two possibilities and opted for the second, even though the second cost several billion dollars. And so the Obama administration said, what we'll do is we will rescue Chrysler by finding a buyer. And of course, since Chrysler had no value as a going concern, you have to pay the buyer. It's like Tom Sawyer's fence. They had to pay someone to take it. They're willing to pay Fiat several billion dollars to take over Chrysler and continue it as a going concern. You end up where the secured creditors end up getting $2 billion for a company that had zero value as a going mm -hmm. concern. And in order to keep it attack running as a going concern, you had to pay off unions. And the reason you had to pay off the unions is because they were able to credibly say, look, you don't keep us in place. You don't pay the retentioners. We're going to shut you down. And they were credible. There were other unions involved in the automobile industry who didn't get anything, in part because they didn't have a credible threat. So the government pays several billion dollars of largesse. Fiat runs Chrysler. And sure enough, a lot of people didn't understand that Chrysler is an Italian automobile company, and it's, Clint Eastwood is able to do ads, say, we're back at a time when they're a subsidiary of an Italian company, and no one was the wiser. Meanwhile, the secured creditors were able to cry, wait a second, we were hard done by because these general creditors got paid a whole bunch of money for this going concern. When we were senior and we only got $2 billion. one reaction, there is one argument that the Secured creditors could have made, but didn't really make, but which I'll get to in a second. But essentially, the secured creditors were saying, look, it's really unfair that the federal government was giving billions in largesse to these unions. And to which you really want to say to the secured creditors, excuse me, you're getting largesse as well because <laughs> you're being paid a positive amount for a company that's not worth anything. And if someone's giving you a bunch of largesse, you shouldn't be shocked they're giving largesse to other people too. Now, I think the one legitimate argument that the secured creditors had, though they didn't make it very forcefully, and I should also say 90% of the secured creditors voted in favor of the government's plan. So the minority was outvoted anyway, because now, again, I asked one of the secured creditors who voted in favor of the plan, who was complaining. And I said, why on earth are you complaining? You voted in favor of the plan. Why did you vote in favor of the plan? And, and again, these creditors were essentially large, systemically important financial institutions that were getting TARP money. And, and he said, oh, Douglas, it's simple. They had AWACS and F-16s and we didn't. That's why we said yes. But at any rate, the legitimate, the only legitimate claim the secured creditors had is that what made the economic argument that said the secured creditors should just be grateful is an economic argument that say the way you value Chrysler is as a going concern. And value doesn't going concern. Chrysler had a negative value. The argument you could make as a secured creditor is to say, look, we're entitled as secured creditors to liquidate the company. And so what we should get is the liquidation value of Chrysler. The book value of Chrysler is about $50 billion dollars. If you simply liquidate a firm, rule of thumb is the liquidation value is 10% of book value. It's still $5 billion, which is a lot more than the $2 billion they got. And there were some divisions of Chrysler, like its transmission business and the Jeep business, that had standalone value. But even then, it's a little bit tricky, right? Because it's how much could you sell Jeep for. If you could sell it to a Chinese firm, you probably could sell it for a couple of billion. But the problem is the United States would not have permitted 
Jeep to be sold to a Chinese firm. So again, there ultimately became a macroeconomic government policy problem. But I don't cry in my cups for the secured creditors that much. First of all, because they themselves were getting government largesse. And secondly, they consented to the plan. And third, it was a macroeconomic intervention that was essentially not designed so much to save Chrysler as it was to protect all the other suppliers in the automobile industry. And that was a messy business, but it's not really about a microeconomic intervention, which most Chapter 11s are about. One last question. The lessons we have about bankruptcy for corporations, are there any lessons that we can apply to the financial distress of countries? We all know that countries can't file for bankruptcy, but they're always defaulting and restructuring. And the Elliott brothers case with Argentina is one that I found fascinating, and it reminded me of things that could have happened in the corporate world if there were no bankruptcy laws. is, And I know, remember, Ann Kruger a couple of years back talked about creating bankruptcy courts for countries. What would that look like? Have you, have, what would, have you, what's the conversation like now about setting up structures for countries? Could we just replicate the credit men, right? That seems to be what you're doing is you're doing norms instead of institutions. Well, you have to get the relevant people together. And the difficulty you have with a sovereign entity, just in the abstract, is that you can't get money from the sovereign. You can't sue the king. And if the sovereign doesn't pay, the sovereign just doesn't pay. And ultimately, what you count on is the need of the sovereign to return to the credit markets again. And the only way the sovereigns can be able to return to the credit markets is if the sovereign does right by virtue of the old debt. So there is this history of of repeat dealing. There is, I should also say, a relatively small group of lawyers who do this international debt restructuring. And again, I was once at a conference where one of them observed after some craziness of some country taking on additional debt, he said, oh, I went back to my firm and I said, oh, the Easter ham's in the oven. This is, uh, there's always going to be business in these this environment. The particular dynamic that is now at work is given the international monetary system, it's very hard for any particular country not to have money in bank accounts all over the world. And the particular engine that was at work in the case of Elliott and Argentina was the fact they were able to point to a particular clause in a bond, this pari passu clause, and say, by virtue of this clause, this other restructuring didn't work, and Elliott was able to be a holdout. And that particular episode just illustrates the importance of figuring out how creditors as as a group can bind themselves. Again, in this country, the history of municipal bankruptcy is, again, based on the idea of a composition. It's based on the idea of not so much that individual creditors as a group vis-a-vis a a country won't understand, okay, we're going to have to do a restructure and we're not going to be able to pay what we are, but rather how can you bind everybody? And the particular problem that Argentina had with Elliot, again, I'm not Elliot's played by a set of rules and was able to take advantage and that this is what happens. But the big challenge with respect to sovereign debt is the same challenge we've had in corporate reorganizations, which is how do you get creditors as a group to agree upon what's in their own self-interest? And the difficulty you have in the international debt context is figuring out some mechanism that gets all the creditors to go along with some kind of restructuring. Well, Doug, thanks so much for joining me. It's been a fascinating conversation. The latest book is called Unwritten Law of Corporate Reorganizations. Lots of other great books. If you want a single volume introduction to the logic of bankruptcy law, I recommend this one, Elements of Bankruptcy, which I think this there must be a more recent edition than this one out there, right? It's now actually in its seventh edition, and the seventh edition also came out this year. So the seventh edition came out the same time as Unwritten Law did, so it's actually completely current. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much. Hopefully, I'll see you again soon. Uh, my pleasure. It's been great. This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 